Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Conversations on Conversations, where each week we explore a topic to help us have more powerful conversations with ourselves and with each other. I'm your host, Sarah Noel Wilson, and I've already got a case of the giggles, and I think this is what's going to happen. Uh, It's Liz's fault now. Joining me today, our special guest is Liz Need, and I'm going to ask her to refrain from chatting for just a second as I do her formal introduction. Um, I, you know, well, we can get into this later because I was trying to remember when, when you and I met because we've just crossed paths for so long, but here, here is the formal background of Liz Need and what we'll be exploring today. Liz Need is an adventure speaker traveling the world and taking on challenges to find lessons of leadership, communication, diversity, and equity and inclusion. A diversity speaker and researcher for over a decade, she specializes common language and daily communication around race and cultural differences in the workplace. Liz uses direct, humorous, very humorous, I mean, very humorous, and vivid style from the stage to create opportunities for communication around differences. She has also served as an executive coach and consultant for DEI challenges for companies like PayPal, News Corp, National Guard, and YWCA. Also, for some of you who are just meeting Liz for the first time, she is a television host and author, writing several Amazon bestsellers, most recently, The 1440 Principle, which you can check out and we will post in the show notes. She also won a regional Emmy for her television show, Life Dare. Liz balances her passionate work with her thriving, beautiful family of seven. I'll add that one in. And uh, husband of 20 years, a retired Army major. Liz Need, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> We're so excited to have you. I when did do you remember when we first met? Yes, we <laughs> do. actually met at the yeah, we met at the the presentation thing that was like timed. Oh, the Pachacha nights. Right. Yes. Yes. And I was like, and I gave a presentation about how to talk like an Indian. Yes. That was my presentation, but that's when I met you. You're right. And that uh, would have been in 2008, 9, 10. Probably. Yeah. Probably 2009, 2010. Yeah. You were, you were in our second, you were like one of our, it was one of the first three, um, one of our first three events for those of you it who were so much fun. Yeah. For those of you who so are hearing fun. me use the word Pecha you might not know what I, like, that means. What, did she sneeze? <laughs> did she sneeze? Gazoon <laughs> tight. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a, it, it came out around the same time as Ted talks and you know, it was an event that was, um, instead of Ted talk being top down experts, Pachakja. Uh, I was calling it the wrong thing. Pichacucha, my gosh. Pichacucha um, was like ground <laughs> up. It was local folks. It's been a while since I've been in there. And and it was an event we ran uh, here in Des Moines for about seven years. And people get 20 slides that are timed for 20 seconds. And they go off and they focus on a topic they're passionate about. And that's right. That is where we met. We've known each other a like while. A long time. You know, what I would say is this. I did a, I did a podcast interview yesterday with Melissa Berkheimer. Mm. And, and I had a similar meeting with her, like it was just ships passing in the night. And what I would say is that was a golden era for Des Moines. Yeah. Like <laughs> a lot of people were super creative, starting businesses left and right. And I met a lot of people that I would, I wouldn't say I'm friends with them. Like I see them all the time, Yeah. but I'm friends with them. Like I could call them anytime I need to Yeah. and ask them for something and they would do their best to deliver. Yeah. And I treasure the, those days because everyone, everyone was starting a podcast and everyone yeah. had like a brochure or a, <laughs> they were starting some board meet, like well, Yeah, like a meet and greet, committee. networking. Yeah. Just, yeah. I mean, that, it was really important. I do think I would not have gotten as far as I did if that wasn't happening at that mm. time. That Every time I went to a Panera, yeah. I walked away with another connection. <laughs> That's such a like beautiful. I, it's such an Iowa thing too. Like you know, we met it at the is. Panera. <laughs> yeah, it was a play. It, I probably got invited to that event because of Panera. Yeah, it's probably where I was. Yeah, uh, who's an unofficial sponsor of the show? We're happy to take your money, Panera. So you just let us know, Liz. Seriously, okay, Liz. That was your formal bio. 
But what else do you want people to just know about you? I mean, I'm going to ask you here in a minute about, you know, like your life experience, you know, sort of your journey sure. to this point. But what what else do you want people to know about you? My, you know, elevator pitch or whatever is that I started this business 15 years ago. And it was during the mortgage bubble bursting. And I I knew I was going to be laid off. And the day I got laid off, I had a smile on my face driving away. I knew I was going to go be a speaker and that I had been thinking about it for a few months. In all honesty, I had been thinking about it since I was five. I didn't know I was thinking about it. Like when everyone else was playing house, I was lighting up my stuffed animals and stadium style and presenting it going, Rabbit, thanks for coming. I appreciate your attention. Hold all your questions until the end. Like I just practiced being me. Wait, wait, where did that come, the, wait, where did that come from? Like that's such a I mean, I remember teaching, weird. but you know, were you exposed to speakers or did you just know that my dad my dad was a professor and the, and also a preacher. He had two jobs and my grandfather was a principal and a preacher. And so I do think it just is in my blood. My sister lives in Paris and she's a a meditation coach mm. and a executive coach and she speaks like it was natural to me. I remember there was a teacher it was uh, a substitute teacher from Yugoslavia and once a year they would have an assembly and she would sit up and talk about how she escaped Yugoslavia. Mm. And everyone else was taken by her story and I was like I can do that. <laughs> I can like it was a thing that grabbed at me constantly. I'm going to be her someday, you know? <laughs> and so I was old. I was 35, 34. It's old for a do-over. Yeah. You know, I had already gone to school and been working for some time, but deep down, it just felt right from the beginning. Mm. And it really went very smoothly after that. Yeah. So what, um, I, I love, I, I love hearing, I love hearing this story, you know, you and I, <laughs> Often the time we get to spend, you know, with each other is when we're in a speaker ready room together and we're like, oh, we're, I'm done and you're getting ready or you're done and I'm done. And let's just sit and talk. Let's talk about some, you know, of the world problems together and and process totally. it. Interesting conversations, uh -huh. um, you know, bonding over our ADHD brains, the the totally. all of that. So, um, you know, so for people who are listening, you know, you can you can. Clearly here, there's lots of areas we can explore. Um, but the topic we're actually going to explore with Liz is near-death experiences, which is something we <laughs> haven't explored on the show. We, um, you know, we were fortunate to have uh, uh, Jen uh, Corland come on and we spent a couple episodes actually talking about she's a death doula. And so we've we've explored that the topic from this perspective. Huh. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Didn't know that that was a thing. Wow. But um, let's let's start with um, why why we're talking about that and your your journey. Just your journey. Yeah, yeah. So um, I used to live in Des Moines. I lived in Johnston, Iowa, and then in August of twenty one, I relocated to Eastern Iowa it was kind of like my husband is retirement age. And so we wanted to make an adjustment that would be more like retirement for him. Mm. So, we so moved Eastern, to Eastern Iowa, Iowa. That, you know, like <laughs> what the heck, but we bought a boat. Okay. Boat okay. People. I was going to say it was the river. Wasn't it? That pulled you in. Yeah. It was the river. Yeah. Absolutely. And we're closer to the kids mm. three hours away from um, faith and Kendall. And then an hour away from Andrew. Mm. So, we wanted to be around our kids more and he wanted, I wanted him to have a place to land. Mm. Like he could spend the, you know, I've taken meetings on the boat. <laughs> it's just like a relaxed way of living. It's a lot of bush light, you know, <laughs> it's that kind of thing. And so we moved and we were empty nesters. Mm -hmm. um, well, no, my daughter Faith was still, she graduated in 22. So we had one more kid left. We were kind of getting ourselves ready for that. And in December of 21, I was at a game. It was Milwaukee playing Marquette. And uh, we went, my daughter, Kendall, is a scholarship athlete, basketball. So we went to the game and watched it. They didn't win. 
after the game we got in the car and we were driving home. And this is the weird part that I don't think Mm -hmm. I described very well, but I don't remember Mm -hmm. a lot of this is that I had good snacks like cheese and, and grapes. Yeah. (laughs) And I had grapes. I had a grape and it stuck wrong. Mm. So a lot of times when you have a heart situation, it feels like indigestion. Got it. That's like a common thing. And I felt like this grape, this is what it felt like. This is not what was happening. Yeah. It felt like the grape was stuck in in my chest. And what was happening is that blood was pooling. I had a leak, essentially, Mm. and I could feel that leak, but it felt like indigestion. And so... I am not a person who readily goes to the hospital. I just don't see the doctor very much. I'm pretty healthy, but we were about an hour away from home and I'm like, you need to take me to the hospital. Mm. Like something's wrong. What I thought was going to happen is I would go to the hospital, wait forever in an emergency room and then be sent home. Like nothing would be wrong. What happened is I checked in and then I had surgery eight hours later. Wow. Heart surgery. Uh, and I had a condition called the uh, an ascending aortic dissection. Uh, it's there's a there's a low survival rate when something like that happens. Like mm-hmm. your your aorta splinters and blood is just in your pooling in your body. So my heart stopped for twelve minutes. Like wow. that's dead. Yeah. Yeah. And. It traumatizes all. I mean, when your heart stops, your body can't function. I mean, everything starts shutting down. So it's brain trauma. It's your organs are affected, you know, and I had several strokes Mm. as well. So the weird thing about it is that, uh, you know, people have uh, motor challenges. Mm -hmm. They they can't talk normally. And I woke up after. This is my version of the story because I was not sitting around waiting (laughs) like the rest of my family was. But um, I was in ICU for two weeks Mm -hmm. and I was uh, not talking. I was intubated. I had all kinds of wires and tubes. And um, two weeks I was there. When I woke up two weeks later, woke up meeting, that's the first thing I remember. Mm -hmm. I was talking and walking. It was Mm -hmm. like nothing had happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, but you know, I was, I was changed Mm -hmm. because you can't, your heart can't stop for 12 minutes and not have, and have no impact. Sure. So I, I suffered from brain trauma. I'm still healing from it. And a lot of other ancillary things happened as a result of that. But my, my family was right by my side the whole time. Mm. My husband and one of my children or both my ch- or two of my children were always by my side, trying to get me to talk, doing my hair, mm. my makeup, get it walking with me if that's what I needed. Um, that was pretty amazing mm. to have my family around me. That's the short version. That's a that's quite ask any questions. That's a that's quite a, a short. I mean, that's quite a short version. And, I you know, I know that you've been on such a journey. I mean, I mean, a couple of things in full transparency, we actually in my family um, had a family member that experienced something similar. And, you know, and knowing the the I, at least so I have some I have some um, uh, connection, some understanding of it. some understanding, yes. especially on the family side of it, of like when you're out, when they come back on, like, are they going to come back on? Is it going to yeah. be the same? Are you going That's to be real? My kids did not know if I would be OK. Yeah. I, if I could show you videos, I look out of it. Like Mm -hmm. I look higher than a kite. And so they were making arrangements and trying to be there for me, not knowing if I was going to have trouble speaking, you know, doing simple everyday tasks. Um, that was hard. That was traumatizing for them. I'm the, I'm the center of the the family universe. And suddenly the bossy Liz was out of it. And, you know, I, I have videos of my daughter, Kendall, we're very close. Mm. And she's like, mom, do an eye push up. Come on. Mm. One eye push up for like, she was basically reverse, Mm. reverse mothering me. Mm. Everything that I gave them came back at me, trying to get me to participate in rehab Mm. and that sort of thing. 
That's a, yeah. I mean, my, you know, my experience of, of you, you know, from a social media perspective and your family is, you, you know, like you're the coach, you're the, you know, yeah. you're the, you're the coach on that, like the cheerleader, the coach and all of that. How, you know, it was, and, and like you said, you're still healing. And I think one of the things when you yeah. and I had reconnected at the end of last year was just the reality is, is that everything changed. You know, like you said, not only physically, <sighs> mentally, um, how people treated you changed, right? Like opportunities changed, your perspective on things, what was important to you. So what shifted? So what changed? Okay. So, and this is, this is more connected to my entrepreneurial story. So the way that I was laid off, I... You know, they're like, you don't have a job anymore and we're, you'll get paid for another two weeks and you need to return your laptop within a week. And I was like, okay. And I wasn't afraid. Mm -hmm. I went back and I, I went to a coffee shop and I made a list of things that I wanted to get done. And I immediately started working on it. I was like, I'm going to be a speaker. So I need to speak. So who am I going to call? I'm going to set up my own speaking engagements. I went and worked out a contract with a place uh, in Des Moines, in Urbandale and started on the path. Like I knew this was mm. the path. And I can tell you that was the story for so many things in my life. Mm. I got pregnant before I was married mm. with twins and again, landed on my feet. I was like, okay, I'm going to have twins and we'll get married six months after they're born. And I'll take them to the park all the time. And, you know, I mean, I didn't, it never was too big of a barrier for me mm. to overcome. Mm. I just have this weird optimism mm -hmm. that I'm going to figure it out. And so that was my background. And so I was the, I knew I was going to walk out of that hospital. That would have been the norm for me. Like, yeah, you had this life threatening condition, but you're going to dance out of the hospital and go home and make dinner and go see your kid run. She had a track meet two weeks after I got home. And they were like, no, you can't go to the mm. track meet. That's five hours one way in the car. Mm. You can't do that. And I was shocked. I was like, what do you mean I can't sit, not drive, and go to a track meet, sit some more, cheer a little, and drive back? And actually, on all the doors of the bedrooms, they have like a, a little thing like if you try to leave. So oh, they like had an alarm? A, yeah, alarm on all the doors because they didn't believe that I got it. Like they didn't think because I was acting like nothing happened. Sure, I was sure. like, I was mad at them for stopping me from going to my daughter's track meet. And um, they thought I was just going to get out and walk. I don't, I don't know. It was January when all this was going on. Like I wasn't walking anywhere. It was cold. But um, so the mindset shift was dramatic. Mm. I was a person who everything had just worked out. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I could tell you story after story. And my husband would always get mad at me and go, you're never going to learn your lesson until something stops you. Like, you're just going to keep rolling downhill until something stops you. And I was always like, well, it always works out. So I'm not going to have a high level of anxiety. And I'm going to watch for the solutions that are going to come my way. And they did, they came my way often mm -hmm. and I, and very successfully. So in this situation, I had some things that I couldn't wiggle out of brain trauma is a mm -hmm. serious thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, I, I had brain trauma. I have suffered from brain trauma. Um, when your heart stops, when you have multiple strokes, things change. I, I am not a hundred percent of who I was. Mm -hmm. And so I got home and, you know, after a week or two pass, I was like, okay, I got to get back to work. Like I'm a speaker. I got to go. I, I had a speaking engagement three weeks after I got home and I went and did it. They were like, do you think you should yes. do that? I go, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> and so I went to Iowa city and I spoke and my daughter Kendall was like, I need to go and make sure she's okay. Mm -hmm. And she gave me feedback. She's like, well, you got up a half an hour before you're supposed to leave. That's a little later than I would have expected. <laughs> Just like watching her mom and what she knew about me. Mm. 
she was like trying to give me feedback. But, you know, I went and spoke without a problem. It was something I was well versed in. Yeah. And, um, you know, got my paycheck and got home and I thought everything's fine. Mm. What I did anticipate eventually, because I wasn't I wasn't promoting myself. Mm. I didn't have I didn't have the wherewithal to do it. I didn't know what I was going to do to promote myself. It usually was a referral mm -hmm. turned into another thing. And I don't know if people knew I was OK or if they weren't asking me because they're like, she just got out of the hospital. I really don't know why it, I, I I probably was on social media less that might have something to do with it. But I had some my last few speaking engagements, uh, probably six or seven throughout the year. And then nobody was asking me. Mm. And here's where I noticed a difference. I'm creative. I think of ways to get in your head. Like I'm like, oh, this person's going to love this. And then I would write a blog or create a video or do a little snippet of something all on brand with the sole purpose of reminding you that I exist. Mm -hmm. So you can pass my name on or hire me to speak. And I wasn't doing that. I was busy healing. Yeah. I was going to rehab. I was just trying to figure out how to be a mom again. And my kids kind of like cut me loose a little because that was part of their traumatic experience sure. is that they had to go back and dig into their lives after paying so much attention to my life. And, um, and that was the adjustment that for the first time, everything didn't fall into place. It wasn't easy. I had to figure out a new list because I couldn't do everything. I, I didn't have the energy to complete everything every day. Yeah. Um, but I had to keep going mm -hmm. or I had to decide I'm going to give up speaking. Yeah. It's interesting. Hopefully that makes no, sense. It, no, it absolutely does. And there's a couple, couple different places that I want to explore a little bit more deeply with you. You know, it's interesting to hear you talk about, you know, your kids cutting off and boy, something that was coming up for me as you were saying that is on some level, I imagine almost that you, your face, you know, n knock on wood. I, I have not been in the position yet of having to face my parents' mortality in such a direct way, right? Like we know it's coming. Yeah. It's the one thing that is true yeah. of this world. And, yeah. you know, and, and that's, um, that's heavy. I mean, that's just, that's a heavy, heavy for them and I mean, heavy the for you. the ones are 27. Yeah. The youngest is 19. That's not an age when you should be faced with right. your parents. And I know that many people, deal with that. That's their daily life. But um, I don't know this if this matters, but I seem very alive. Mm. I seem very like lit up and passionate. That's how I parent. I don't have a mellow bone in my yeah. body. I am. <laughs> like, I wake like up. Liz I is like eight to 11. Like I've never seen Woo! you two or three. Like it it's is. always eight to no, 11. It's true. It is. I give myself five minutes after I wake up and I hit the ground running like a like Fred Flintstone. Yeah. Driving a car. Well, that, that's, and so they oh, know sorry. me as that. And then I was, Oh yeah, they know me as that. And then they had to face not having me. Like mm. the doctor was like, she, her heart stopped, but she's okay. Like that's a lot for yeah. someone to handle. Yeah. So they had to recover from that. Mm -hmm. And probably are still like having some yeah. healing from that trauma as well. Absolutely. We're all in therapy. Yeah, good. <laughs> Every one of us has a therapy because we need to talk it out. It's yeah. when life doesn't go as planned, you need someone to guide you back on the path. I, okay. So, you, you know, <clears throat> as you bring that up and, you know, and, and the intention, the intention with this show is to explore topics that might be situations you may encounter, maybe have encountered or might know somebody who's encountering and, one of the things that I was I was curious about is, again, I could I could imagine that. Like, we're just so grateful that you're back and you're healthy. Right. And kind of like Thank we're you. back. And then that realization of like and things are different and something did happen to all of us. And, you know, and, and I 
I mean, we know that lots of people experience trauma all the time and then they don't have the space to process it and all of that. So I appreciate you sharing about therapy. We're very pro therapy on the show. Um, one, one thing that I was curious about is, you know, just for you, one of the things I think are, is a similarity between us, although I think you're a level even higher than me is we move fast, you know, like, you know, pre all of this fast, like really fast thinker, fast talker, right? We would always talk about like, we got to slow ourselves down. And, you know, and I imagine that there's probably some, some component of your recovery is that your brain might not work exactly the same, right? Maybe it, it isn't as it fast. It does not work the same. Yeah. So talk to, yeah. so talk to me about that. And what I'm, what I'm curious about too, is just what has that been like navigating and I don't know if you view it as a loss, but or maybe it's just a shift and a change. But because yeah. because that's um, also been so much of your identity, right? I mean, I think that's that's something that's also unique is that uh, it isn't just the, oh that this happened, but you you've been a personality, and your personality has been di- you know uh, directly tied real. to who you are as a person. And so not only has this shifted you as a person, but this moment shift is shifting how people are experiencing you, their perception of you, the story they say, all of that. So I'm curious what comes up for you. I, I've in my, like, since I was a child, I've put a lot of um, faith in my intelligence, mm-hmm. my ability mm-hmm. to learn and regurgitate and hit the ground running. And that's part of my success is that I'm not afraid to fail. And I jump in and I go, I'll figure it out. Like, I'm just going to do it and I'll figure it out. Uh, and this has slowed me down. Mm. I don't, I've, I've had speaking engagements that didn't go as well as I wanted. And I was unfamiliar with that feeling. Mm. I was like, yuck, I, I'm good at this. I was born to do this. And now suddenly I can't keep up with myself. Mm. Like it was really hard. The humility it takes to heal. Mm. It's so humbling um, to allow yourself the grace to make mistakes, to forgive yourself for not being as amazing as you're supposed to be. Um, How do you market yourself that way? Um, You know, I I went to a neurologist and they showed me where the holes are in my brain. And they said, you know, you're not experiencing any deficits because your brain is moved that center to another part of your brain and continued on. And I was like, but where, you know, I wasn't interested in knowing where the deficits were, like where, Mm. if, if my brain had shifted, what I would have been missing. Now I want to go back to the neurologist and go, tell me about these holes. Mm. It'll explain issues that I have. But that's probably how I've had to face it is sometimes I rest Mm. like I was never a napper, but now I'm like, I, that's how my brain heals Mm. is when I sleep. So I go to bed early. I don't drink. I was always a very good drinker. And now I'm like, eh, I'm not drinking because I love the sleep I get. And it's, I'm popping all these pills to keep my blood pressure low. And I don't want to get in the way of that. So I haven't drank for a year. Wow. And I don't miss it. I don't, I don't, you know, it used to be like a little bit of a olive oil to my social situation, Mm, like mm -hmm. just made it easier to be me. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, I don't need it. I can be fine without it, Mm. which is very less fighting with my husband, Mm. better sleep, um, you know, less fat around my belly. I mean, I can sing the praises of not drinking, (laughs) but, um, it's really about setting myself up for having the clearest head possible. Mm. It used to be that anything could happen and I would find a way to have a clear head. Mm. But now I realize I need, I need a little help like everybody else does. I can't, I can't do this without, um, some grace. Mm. So, um, I just started a podcast. <gasps> Congratulations. I just recorded. Yeah. I'm excited. It's what's it called? It's the three things. It's three things for lack of a better title. It's the three things podcast where I share three things that you can use to overcome whatever barrier. So today it was three things you can do to create a really strong vision board. Hmm. 
but it could be anything. It could be three things to not be an overbearing parent mm. or three things to get along with your spouse or get in shape or, you know, the list could go on and on. Um, but, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have <laughs> like, I don't know how to, I just hopped on and recorded. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if I use the right app or I don't know what to do with the, the, um, the audio file. I don't know. I mean, I did it. I vi- I have a video file too. What do I do with that? <laughs> like it's a whole thing, but I realize I'm ending up in the same place that I did before, which mm. is you just go do it. Yeah. How else? No one knows what they're doing in the beginning. So go do it and realize it's going to change a hundred times mm-hmm. before you're done. Mm-hmm. And it's going to morph into something beautiful, but this is you taking a step. Mm. And I celebrate that step because I still have so much to offer. Um, I believe that. I believe oh, yeah. I need to help people. Like I get up with a desire to make someone's day better. Mm. And that's a spiritual charge. If you feel that way, you should be in the business of helping people. Mm. Um, and so I still believe that in spite of everything that happened, that I didn't die for a reason mm. and that I need to honor that every day, finding another way mm. to reach people and, and make them better at what they do, better at being part of community, better at reaching their level of intelligence. So I'm more passionate about that now than I was before. And I was pretty passionate about it before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. One of the things, one of the things you said that I think, you know, that I want to, I want to poke at a little bit, not poke at in a bad way, but just you were talking about now you're being really intentional about having the clearest head possible. But before it was sort of like, yeah, 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 I'll find it. I'll figure it out. Yeah, I had the energy to find. Yeah. It. And, you know, and there's and also that some of that, you know, some of that is absolutely your personality. And some of that is my ADHD. Yeah. And some of it's our culture, though. Like we have a very like hustle don't value rest yes. culture, like figure it out, you know, do all of that. And that that is something that has been evolving on my personal journey of just how how can I be more um, intentional and responsive to building that space to building that rest to um, instead of it always being like, well, I'm burnt out. And now I have to do it. Not that I'm always good at it. But I I you know, I was just hearing you talk, reflecting on that idea of how often we don't, we don't try to rest and get clarity until after we're fried. And then what is possible, actually, if we are much more intentional and and also just having that, you know, um, boy, that phrase you said, it takes humility to heal. Oh, is just it really does. I did not me. want to admit that I was, I had gone through something. Mm. I was like, I envisioned myself walking out of here and without a problem. And that's what I did. I walked out without any obvious problems, but I needed healing. My, the daughter that is the most like me, who's Kendall, she had to be really rough with me. She's like, mom, you had brain trauma. You're not okay. And I was like, you can give me a, be a little more encouraging, geez. <laughs> but she wanted me, she felt better if I acknowledged what my problem was. Sure. And um, again, part of my success is this optimism. I just don't give the boogeyman too much credit. Yeah. And then I, and sometimes the boogeyman just lets me walk on by. But um, when you have something like this, like a near death experience, the, the cost to your soul is significant. Mm. You have to give yourself time to bounce back. Um, and so I did. I took trips to see my girlfriends. I took out-of-town trips with my husband. I went to see all my kids at their various places. Like I needed to soak that up, yeah. that family time, that love from my community and I've always been a person to take it or leave it kind of person. Mm-hmm. Like I love being around people, but they're always there. Yeah. <laughs> I just never really worried about it. Yeah. I have a nice, nice, tight, kind of big community. Yeah. But suddenly I needed them more than they needed me. I really, mm. that's, 
that's humility where you go, you know, I need to call that person and say, would you come visit me? Or can I come visit you? And can we spe- can we go out to dinner? And, and I opened up, I started talking about this situation I'm in, um, how hard it was today to go to my desk and sit down and record this not this unworthy podcast mm. that I know I'm going to look back at it in a year and go, that was your best effort. Like seriously, lady, but, um, to forgive myself for being not as good as I used to be. Yeah. Cause that's what I did for the first three or four months is I was like, this is, this is the rag doll list. Mm. She's not mm. as good as she used to be. And my, my therapist calls it the death of my ego death. Mm. Cause I was so mad. Like I was like, I don't even want to get up and shower. I hate putting makeup on. Like, I don't want to get ready and find clothes that are matching for what? Why? Like it, nothing felt worthy of my attention. Mm. I literally just got up and I get out of the shower and be like, Oh my God, I have no clothes on. <laughs> I'm so tired. I have to find clothes. And, um, I developed a little anxiety sure. like, of getting ready anxiety. Cause it just felt pointless. Mm. And mm. I realized I needed to find solace in the rhythm of my life, doing things well, just opening up my, um, my planner and realizing that's an opportunity. Like whatever I chose to do was an opportunity for that day. Mm. And, um, that's been tough. Sure. That's been, I'm a Mm know-it-all. I mean, that not knowing it all has been the toughest pill to swallow, but that's part of my journey is I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow, but it's going to be good. I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. It'll be good. You know? Yeah. And it's like when you, well, when we were talking about, it's just that redefining success, you know, again, because when you're, (sighs) you know, it feels good to be a speaker. It feels good to have the inquiries coming. It feels good to be wanted and needed. And also it feels good to feel like you're making a difference and getting, and especially, I mean, and then there is the layer of, you know, as ADHD brains, getting that dopamine hit that we don't, produce naturally right and so then then there's that yeah. that complexity as well you know you you said something really poignant about how you needed your friends more than they needed you and one of the things that I was curious about to explore is just how how people have shown up with you um you know or and maybe one way to think for us to to frame this is for people who are listening, who may have loved ones or friends or colleagues who've experienced something, sometimes what I've observed is that when there's some sort of fundamental life change, for whatever it may be, maybe it's a death of a loved one, maybe it's some new lived experience, right, having a child, whatever the monumental change is, is that sometimes the tolerance or the patience other people have for like giving you that space or holding that space sometimes is less than what you need. I don't know if I'm making sense there, but no, it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, I think that people expect you to be funny. I'm funny. I, Mm. I, I come in with the quip, the well-timed quips. I am, I always, you know, what is Liz doing? What is she up to? You know, you weren't surprised. I started a podcast. You're like, finally, yeah. (laughs) like there's an expectation. Um, for a certain type of person. Yeah. I mean, I think I hit all of the check marks of the kind of person that you watch on the move. And it hurts when people don't understand I'm a step slower. Mm. It, it's hard. Mm. That's, that's a humility to go. Yeah. She's, she's not the same. Yeah. She's literally, it's going to take me twice as long to do what I did before. And, um, I'm going to be twice as proud of it. It's very odd. Mm. But I, my community has shown up for me. Like my son, um, my son and his girlfriend stayed for two months. Mm. He lives in Atlanta. And they had, they paid rent on an apartment and lived in my house. And they weren't ready. He just didn't want to leave me. He mm. was like, she still needs me. And I think about how gratifying it is. I really show up for my kids. I'm very physically on for them. They are of great interest to me. So my daughter is going to play basketball tonight. 
That's my big thing. What are you doing tonight? I'm in front of the couch watching ESPN. My daughter's going to play. Um, my other, my son works at CNN and I mean, he loves his life. He loves his career. And every time I talk to him, I just want him to brag and tell me everything he loves about it. So this kid showed up for me. Mm. Like it, they're not, I wasn't pouring into a, a vase without a bottom. Mm. Like they caught everything I gave. And um, willingly, like Mother's Day last year was amazing. Christmas last year was amazing. They just showed up knowing that I needed love, almost like a child. Mm. And my friends did the same. Like when the year of when I was put in the hospital came up, I had the biggest bouquet of flowers where they were like, I'm so glad you're here. They all came at one time and we had a weekend together celebrating that we're all healthy and together. And I mean, I really feel a greater sense of trust mm. for human beings in general. Like I can be a little sarcastic and dark <laughs> about people. <laughs> like, I don't know the, not to get political, but the whole last president made it so that I didn't, I, they did. People disappointed me. Yeah. So, um, but this really brought, I'm like, I'm loved. Mm. And it's another reason why I keep going back to I'm here for a reason. Get to work. Mm. Do the things that you, you know, whatever's weighing on you, you need to get out there and do it. Um, don't wait for people to inquire. Go offer. They don't even know what they need. Go offer what you think they need. Um, it's made me more driven mm. and and more um, willing to reach out to people and say, I need this from you. Can you, I mean, I did that with you, yeah, Sarah. Yeah. I, I said, I need, if you got to, if someone needs a speaker, mm -hmm. point me in their direction. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that I would have done before. I would have been the all knowing Liz. Mm. <laughs> I remember sitting but on my parents' I house. People. I think, yeah, it was, I think it was yeah. Thanksgiving time you reached out to me and I was, I was with, I was, yeah. I was at my parents' house and I remember looking at my phone going, why is Liz calling me? I'll, I'm going to, I'll take no, this. Yeah. I'm going to answer this and see what's going. And, and that, and you're right. And I, I was mean, like, help. And I, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, and I appreciated that you knew that you could reach out. And I, and I yeah. also know, like knowing, knowing who you were and, and, and who you are, like knowing that, that, the, again, that the humility that that takes, cause it's like your rock star Liz, like that's the, you oh, know, that's the, it's, you know, can I be honest with you though? Yeah. It's exhausting. Oh, I'm like, sure. I, I am falling in love with myself again. Like I'm learning mm. to see the things that are not defined by the things I normally define myself. It's not productivity. It's mm. not killing my to-do list every day. It's the love that I have for humans mm. that I'm like, admire that. I'm like, okay, girl, you're good. Things will come of this. But um, it's exhausting to have that much belief in yourself. Like I've never had to have this much belief in myself. And I've had to have a lot of moments where I was like, go girl, you got this. But now I'm get up and I'm like, oh gosh, okay, go, 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 go. Like I just, you know, and the ideas that I have and, you know, where I'm like, you know, like right now I'm putting together a workbook that's a DEI workbook. Mm. It's going to be, it's going to look kind of like a kid's book and have maybe 40 pages and be something that I can sell to companies. Mm. That would have been a nothing thing. I would have yeah. spent a day putting that thing together. It's three pages into it. It's been a week and I'm just slowly doing it. But you know what? I love that I have those ideas. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good thing. And I'm going to honor that. And it doesn't matter if it takes two months, it doesn't matter or a year or whatever. I'll get it done eventually. And it will be it'll have value. Yeah. So it's what a you know, what a great, you know, so much of this is I mean, so much of your work before and still is about how do we honor differences. And, mm -hmm. and again, I think in our culture of American culture. I'll be really clear because we have a very global audience. So when I'm saying uh, uh, our culture, yeah, we should be it explicit. Is American. It's very American culture, and you know, and 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 um, 
And how do we create space for different rhythms and different time frames and different, you know, like there, it, it is such a, you know, like this has to get done and this has to get done. And, and it's so easy to feel like you're a failure and, and the, you know, and, and I'll tell you what, like, this is not, I'm not saying this as any kind of um, comparison, not the, this is not apples to apples, but we were talking about COVID before. And when I had gotten COVID, um, I had experienced fatigue in a way that I've never experienced for months, right? The kind of fatigue of, it wasn't even just, I was trying to explain it to somebody and I said, it's not even like, oh, I'm kind of tired. It's, I gotta find a couch Bold. now or else yeah. I'm gonna be like sleeping on the floor or against this like <laughs> washing machine or something. And there's no space for you to be that tired. No. Where are you supposed to be tired? Right. Yeah. And and even, you know, and 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 I feel, you know, as I, I always have felt, you know, like I'm very pro-human. I'm very pro-human experience. I'm very pro, but I feel like even more so now, it's like it's literally nothing we're doing is life or death. So take your time, right? Like nothing, yeah. nothing we're doing is that critical. And sometimes there's so much unnecessary stress and suffering and sometimes anger when things are just not moving as quickly or someone else isn't, mo you know, moving as quickly. And it's like, I don't know. The unless pressure is significant. It's a significant pressure to yeah. be productive in a very high level. And, it's a and, lot of pressure. It's yeah. And, and, and to that point of, I think like, um, and the expectation of how somebody will be. And I, and, and that is something that I know I've, as I've thought about you and your journey is, um, when people are used to you being at a 10, eight, nine, 10, 11, there are times when I do, you do, I do want to be at a two. And then people are like, well, yeah. what's wrong with you? What happened, what happened to you? To you? Yeah. Like, I don't know. And it's like, well, no, this is the human experience. And and how do we, you know, it's something I'm just chewing on is I'm sitting reflecting about this conversation right now is how, how do we continue to give more space to all shades of our human, mm. you know, experience and what we need and 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 how that's this different? This is something that I can, uh, yeah, I can offer this to anyone listening. Mm. Because you don't have to have a near-death experience to live in my experience, post-near-death experience, mm. which is that it's not a race. Mm. It is not a You don't get up and start the race. You start, you get up and you have to get connected with the power that is you. You have to really invest in the reconnection, the putting together the two little you know, like hot wire yourself, <laughs> like get up and figure that out. And don't think of it as a waste of time. If mm. you feel like you don't have time to sit for five minutes with yourself, or you don't have time to write out how you want your day to go. Um, you know, you're rushing through your vision board, you're rushing through your therapy appointment, like whatever it is, there's no, there's no blue ribbon for the person who gets through all of it. Like I did all of that for 15 years. Mm. You know, I don't, no one's patting me on the back mm. saying you're, do you did such a good job. I'm going to help you now. Mm. You know, you've been so committed for so many years. I'm going to help you now. That didn't happen. Mm. It was like, I didn't do anything, which was, I had a good amount of anger about that. Like, where are you people? Like I was consistent for so long. You can't ask me what I'm doing now. Like, of course I'm doing the same thing. And yes, I want your help. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, but give yourself grace, give yourself grace, give yourself room to create and to spread your wings and make a difference and put meaning into your everyday life. Cause that is the human experience. We want meaning mm. in the minutes of our day. Have you ever written that down? Is that like a Lizism? Because if it's not, it needs to be. It's in my be. 1440 book. Is it? Okay. I was like that. I was like, that's really poetic. Either this is like a core <laughs> of her. Yeah. 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 I love it. Such <laughs> I was like that. Very that nice. is a mic drop moment. And Yay. I was like, is that a yes. Lizism? Because that feels like a Lizism. And if it's not, I want to make sure that we repeat it. So it is a Lizism. Thank so. you. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, Liz, I want to, I want to, I feel like that's such a beautiful, like, how do we, Say it again. How do we put meaning in our minutes? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. We need a, we need meaning in our minutes. Mm. 
We really do. We're not trying to master the the planner. We're trying to master the minutes. Mm. And there's a lot that will come of that, a lot of good that will come out of that. I'm so, so grateful for you. Uh, before we like officially wind down, though, I do I do want to ask you the last question. We always ask every guest, you know, because we always want to invite our, our listeners to be thinking about the same thing. And that question is, what is a conversation you've had with yourself or with others? Now, you've shared quite a few examples already, but if there's something yeah. else. Uh, <laughs> Clearly, I talk to myself <laughs> all the time. <laughs> but what what is a conversation you've had with yourself or others that was transformative for you? I mean, the big question that I have had, it's an ongoing conversation is why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Like that is a worthy question. Why? And I don't know, we get out of college and we start, we ask why one time and then we go for until we're 80 mm -hmm. and we wonder why we lose our way. Mm -hmm. So before I do things like put together the DEI workbook or I put together the podcast, I've said, if this isn't worth your time, don't do it. Find some, another task will come and replace this and um, holding myself accountable for that. I can do anything I put my mind to. So it should be worth something mm. and um, be driven by the passion that you're born with. And so that is keeping me on the straight and narrow. I guess. I love you so much. I'm so I'm so glad. Thank you for having oh, me. Oh, so excited. I know. <laughs> and <then> I, <laughs> I was I knew it would be good. Oh, yeah. No, I, I knew we'd be no shortage of conversation. But I also know I appreciate it because I um, I, I mean, just a final note, because, you know, you and I you and I have been very much respected colleagues for a very, very long time. For sure. Um, yeah. You know, beloved colleagues might be how I describe, you know, but not necessarily like super close friends. And I, I will share when right. you reached out, that actually meant a lot. And it it meant and and um, on multiple levels. And, and it was also a really beautiful um, example of the power of connecting and feeling more yeah. personally connected Which with you, you very now. well. Well, thank you. So do yeah, you. I, and, but that felt like a Oh, we haven't had this kind of relationship. And I'm 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 glad that we have this kind of relationship. And I'm glad that, you know, we can be of support to each other in a way that is on a a deeper level than just like, hey, I'm gonna recommend, you know, but just like this has been hard. It's hard because people are, you know, unsure and recommendations, you know, and, and talking about that. And and what I also appreciated is, you know, knowing that um yeah, like and you know, we ha we're in each other's corners. Like it was always true, but I don't know. I just wanted to name, I just wanted to th yes. thank you for trusting me with that and know how much I, um, yeah, just the, like, I didn't take that for granted. And, and so I'm yeah. so glad that we got to be together today and we'll continue to support yes. each other. And so, so with that, so for people who are curious about Liz as a speaker, she's incredible. I can attest She's, as you've heard on, on this conversation, incredibly passionate, wise, um, has a ton of experience. And so if people are listening and going, hmm, like I want to learn more about the work she's doing or I want to connect with her personally yes. or I'm looking for a speaker, what's the best way for people to connect with you? The best way is to go to my website, which is my name, LizNeed.com. It's L-I-Z-N as in Nancy, E-A-D. And... You can see a full list of a comprehensive list of my topics, plus or minus a few. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's always evolving when you're a speaker. Sure. So I can I can I would love to create a new topic just for you. Just call me. And then there's a contact me page so you can put your information there and I will call you. I have not become famous enough that I don't return <laughs> phone calls. So I would love the opportunity. Yeah. And we'll we'll be sure to post all that information in the show notes so people can have access. You know, also, we we invite that if there's, um, you know, just want to connect and share stories. That's always right. I know that you're very yes, open to that, that that kind of connection. Yeah. So Liz, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm thank so you grateful for, for you. Me. It was really fun to talk to you. Yeah, I likewise. You're good at what you do. Oh, thank you. You same, you're good at what same you do. sister. Same. <laughs> 
Our guest this week has been my dear colleague, Liz Need. And one of the things that 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 phrase she said of healing takes humility is uh, really resonating with me deeply today. And that's something I want to hold on to. And we want to hear from you what resonated about our conversation. You know, maybe there's a aha you had or a similar experience. And we'd love to hear from you. So you can always send us a, a message at podcast at sarahnollwilson.com. You can also find me on social media where my DMs are always open. And if you'd like to find out more about the work that we do and how we can help your team have conversations that matter, uh, check us out at sarahnollwilson.com. You can also pick up a copy of my latest book, Don't Feed the Elephants, wherever books are sold. And if you'd like to support the show, which we always appreciate, please consider becoming a patron. You can visit patreon.com slash conversations on conversations, where not only your financial support will sustain this podcast and the amazing team that makes it possible, you also get access to some pretty great swag and other benefits. And if you haven't already, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your preferred podcast platform. Uh, the more subscribers, the more reviews, the more ratings we get, regardless of what they are, we hope you give us a five, help us increase our visibility so we can continue to bring on great guests like Liz Need. A big thank you to our incredible team who makes this podcast possible, to our producer, Nick Wilson, sound editor, Drew Knoll, transcriptionist, Becky Reinert, marketing consultant, Caitlin Semin Nelson, and the rest of the Snowco crew. Thank you. Uh, and a big thank you to Liz Need for coming on the show, sharing so vulnerably in her beautiful, human, heartfelt, humorous way. I'm just so grateful to have her be here with us. This has been Conversations on Conversations. Thank you so much for joining us, for listening and being part of our community. And remember, when we can change the conversations we have with ourselves and others, we can change the world. So till next time, be sure to rest, rehydrate, and we'll see you again next week.